Well, you know what I'm going to do? I think what I'll do is Stuart can come in. I've got something I need to read to all of our public members who are here. So let's call the meeting to order and I'm going to read this thing. And then that'll be the time after I'm done with that, that member attendees, anybody who wishes to speak to us can, but we'll wait till Stuart comes just because this is our first time doing an electric meeting, electronic meeting, and there's always a few bugs, right? Um, so first of all, this I want to make, I want to read the meeting statement for live council meeting protocols. So please be aware that this is live council meeting is being recorded. So your personal information, which could be your image, although actually it isn't, we can't see any of you guys, your voice, your name, your opinions, any other personal information disclosed by you during the meeting is collected by the city of Roslyn under the Freedom of Information Protection and Privacy Act for the purpose of your participation in public input. So this, this uh, meeting is recorded. Usually our meetings at, at the Miners Hall aren't recorded, but they used to be recorded when we had a city hall. So there you go. We're going back to the past. Um, if you have any questions about collection of your personal information, please contact dco at roslin.ca. That's Cynthia, our deputy corporate officer. If you do not wish your personal information to be collected, please do not join the live council meeting, but you'll miss so much fun. Um, in order to run the public input period smoothly, if you wish to comment on an agenda item, please use the raise your hand button and I will call on those who wish to speak by name. When your name is called, please unmute your microphone, then state your name yourself and your comments. Okay, so I hope everybody's got that and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. If anybody wants to practice raising your hand right now while we wait for Stuart, you're welcome to do it. Otherwise, we just wait a couple minutes more. I don't see any hands raised, so if anyone's trying to raise their hand. Oh, wait, somebody raised their hand. Ooh, it's Andy. Okay, Andy. Yeah, it works. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, figure Can everybody find the icon just so it can be used? Maybe the attendees. I don't know what their screen looks like. So... Um, one of you fine attendees, help us work out the details here. Put your hand up and let's see. Okay. There, there. we go. We have a winner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. There's Sarah and Barry. Yeah. Okay. So Barry, hopefully you are seeing the same screen. Do you see the screen with all the panelist faces on it? Okay. Okay. He sees what we're seeing because actually we're cheating this time. He's in the same room in case I get into trouble and need help. Okay. Maybe he could give the maybe he could give the panelists just a quick I on the ones who aren't he and Sarah um, just a quick uh, idea where the hands up icon is. Okay, well Sarah's just raised her hand, so I'm going to allow Sarah to talk. Go ahead, Sarah. Yeah, She's muted. Huh? I just hit the allow to talk, Sarah. She might have to mute from her side. Yeah. Oh. I, just, I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good girl. You okay. can't hear me though, because I've got paper over my camera. Um. <laughs> it doesn't matter. We can't see you. We can't see any. You guys are all, the public is there as attendees. We don't see any of you. You can see us, but we can't see you. We have a list. Hold on a second. Stuart's calling. Sorry about that. I'll be right back. Yes. You yes, sir. All we see, we just see a list of everybody's name who's a, the attendee who's, uh, who's joined from the public, but we can't see your faces when you speak. Yeah, That's you don't good. have to cover up your camera. You, yeah. Well, I, I keep it that way all the time. Anyway, the, the raise hand icon is in the middle of the bottom of the screen under all your nice faces. Okay, now you know something is interesting. Now I'm looking at this screen. Sarah, somebody with a camera on, raise your hand. And let's see if we do see your face. Actually, we might. Some, somebody else of the attendees. Any of you, Dave, Kimberly, Mark, Oliver, Patrick, Scott, one of you guys. Okay. Should I uncover my uh, camera? There you go, Oliver's. Oliver yeah. and Kimberly have their hands up. Okay. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So Oliver, 
Yes. Okay, I see Oliver. Okay, I take that back what I said, Sarah. We do see a face, so keep your camera covered if you don't want us to see you. Right. <laughs> Hello, Oliver. Thank you for coming. Sorry, this is a little rough to start, but uh, it's okay because we're still waiting for a counselor to, to, who's struggling to get into, so. But Kathy, I think the face that we see of Oliver is just a picture. It's not his actual video. Well, that's true, but maybe that's how he has it. Oliver, is that how you have yeah, it? Yeah, that's a setup. It's a setup, see? We don't even know if that's him. <laughs> you set it up. <laughs> okay. Let's it's see. a really good picture, Oliver, so I stick with it. <laughs> Thank you. My wife is a photographer. <laughs> okay, let's see. So, Barry, you have your hand up. Do you? Okay. Okay. Okay, so now it's interesting. You guys are not... Oh, talking is permitted. Let's see. Oh, man. Disable talking. I'm going to disable talking for all you guys right now. Sorry. Muting doesn't do it, it looks like. Maybe it does. Uh, this is not entirely intuitive, I've got to say. Okay. Okay, that seems to be working. Okay, now, all members of the public, you guys are not allowed to talk until you raise your hands again. And I see that little icon and I call you. And now let's see, do we have, has Stuart joined us? Not yet. And we've lost Chris again. Oh yeah, where's Chris? Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, Chris is back. Maybe. Chris, were you in trouble? No, Chris is back. Okay. Things and I pressed the wrong button, I'm sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Fast forward to send it to the Just refresh because I just have to reset to it as well. Stuart's on the phone. He's on the phone with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we could do that. Well, or should I start public input? Okay. 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 Yeah, okay. Um, okay, you guys, we are actually going to get started because Stuart's having some technical difficulties um, and he will join us, but I'm going to open it up to uh, call the meeting to order and we're going to have public input. So if there's anyone of our attendees here who would like to speak about something, you don't have to, we're not going to put you on the spot, but if you would like to say something to us about anything, um, now is the time to put your hand up and I'll call on you and you can speak to us. Nobody? <laughs> you guys are just here to see how, <laughs> to see how these electronic meetings work for our first time. Okay, so really nobody, nobody wants, nobody wants to talk. I do notice that Scott Lamont, who is going to be our new public works manager, is on the line. Nice to, nice, nice to see your name there, Scott. We don't actually see you, but welcome. Um, okay, so if nobody wants to say anything, and I'm assuming that means you don't because nobody's saying anything, um, I'm going to move on to adopting the agenda. Can I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Janice moves it and Chris seconds it. All in favor of the agenda as presented? Raise your little pause. Okay, that's good. Now the one thing here is I don't see, no, I guess it's, I just, I don't see him because he's not here. Okay, thought I was missing a picture. Okay, so now that we've done that, we're going to move on to our delegation for the night. And so this is representative from Grant Thornton, our municipal auditors, and we have the lovely Kirsten Packham here to talk to us about our audit. So Kirsten, take it away. Okay, Thank, thanks so much, Kathy. So yeah, I'm Kirsten Packham, and um, I'm a manager at Grant Thornton, um, manager of the municipal audit. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. <laughs> what an exciting, what an exciting meeting to be part of. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm here um, and happy to answer any questions that you might have um, from the audit. Um, so basically. I know that Elma is going to speak speak to the financial statements kind of as a whole, but um, our report as auditors 
is um, the audit report that sits at the uh, at the front of the financial statements. And basically um, what it does is it just provides our opinion. So um, in, um, in for this year, um, we are we are we have an unqualified opinion, which means that um, we what we found is that uh, the statements are fairly stated um, as they were presented, um, and uh, yeah, that there was no significant issues. So the the big thing that we're as auditors are looking for is a material misstatement. Um, and there was no material misstatements um, identified. In fact, um, it was an excellent audit this year, really clean. Um, there was, you know, only three adjustments, I think, that together uh, Elma and I identified. Um, we also provided um, our report to the, what we call the report to the audit committee or report to council, which um, this year combines what in the past you would have seen as our audit planning letter and our management letter. So the format of those documents um, changed a little bit this year. Um, that's kind of one of the changes with Grant Thornton. But it, it puts the, the two documents together. Um, and so that document talks about um, the, the scope and, and the, the things that we do. So the responsibilities of management, um, which is to prepare the statements. Um, it's the responsibilities of you as counsel, which is the oversight over, over the statements and us as the auditors to, to go, go through and do our work to um, identify whether there's any material misstatements. The other thing that that um, report identifies or that document identifies is what um, historically you would have seen as um, a management letter, which um, uh, so one of one of the things that we do look at, um, but that isn't the main purpose of our work is um, internal control issues. And so the management letter in the past has identified um, we've identified issues that have come up. Um, so this year, there, there really wasn't any issues. The only thing um, that, that came up was an issue related to the tangible capital asset module of VADM, um, which Alma has uh, described in her report and is also described in, in our report, um, just in terms of a calculation area. Um, so again, it wasn't a, ma a material misstatement, but we, we've identified it and Alma has corrected it and um, cor you know, identified processes for going forward so that um, there isn't an, an issue going forward. So um, yeah, other than that, I just wanted to confirm that things are in good order and uh, we really appreciate the help of Alma and all her staff. Um, we, we were lucky this year that we were able to get in before all of this craziness happened because it certainly made um, makes the audit a lot more efficient to be on site. And I guess I'll just open it up to any questions, if there are any. Okay. Thank you, Kirsten. Uh, Council, are there any questions about the audit? Um, when we get into, you know, Elma's report, you can ask Elma about that, but anything specifically for Kirsten from Grant Thornton? Do you have anything? I am seeing all of you. Thank you for, for making it, Stuart. That's great. Glad you got in. Welcome. <laughs> um, any questions? It's looking like no questions. All right. Well, that's the shortest delegation you've probably had to do yet, Kirsten. Yep, thank, so far. thank you so much for coming. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> okay. All right. Take care. Okay, moving on, we've got some minutes uh, to adopt. And you know what, wait a minute, hold on a second. And this is bad procedurally, but I think particularly with Anthony here and members of the public who may be more interested in hearing about the development uh, permit discussion, I didn't move it forward on the agenda before we adopted the agenda, but can we amend our adoption of the agenda? And that way Anthony doesn't have to stay there behind a blue screen all night. Um, that would be bringing 8A, and we would do 8A at, uh, we could do it at 6A. Can I get a, a mover to that? Andy will move it, and we're amending it, and Janice will second it. Okay, all in favor of the agenda as amended. Sorry about that. That was procedurally horrible, but I think that'll make everybody happy then. If you don't want to hear anything else of our meeting, you can drop off at that point. Um, okay, so we do have a couple of minutes to adopt before we get there. So first up are minutes of the regular meeting on March 9th. 
and we need these to be adopted. Do I see a mover? Janice and a seconder. Seconder, Chris. Okay, all in favor of those minutes? Okay, good. And then we have some meetings of the public hearing that same date, March 9th. These are to be adopted as well. A mover. Come on, guys, put your hand up. This, this is the quick part. Okay, Stuart, second by Chris. All in favor of those? Okay, nobody had any questions on those. Okay, now we have minutes of the Heritage Commission meeting on the 2nd. You need a mover. Janice, seconded by Dirk. Um, okay, any comments on that? All in favor? Oh, wait, did you have a comment, Andy? No. Typo, uh, can't, uh, page 23, uh, commission minutes, uh, login versus logo. Oh, okay. So a typo. A typo. I, it's just a typo. It's yeah, okay. we, don't, we don't need to worry too much about typos, but that's okay. All in favor of those minutes with the exception of the typo. Okay, good. Um, then the last minutes we have are the Sustainability Commission held on March 18th. Uh, we need some adoption on that. Dirk says it, and Chris seconds. Any comments on that? All in favor? Okay. Oh yeah, we should probably have Kirsten identified as staff in there instead of a, a, an attendee, I think. Okay, so now we're gonna dive right in to 8A, which is the development permit application. So Anthony, you're gonna have to come back. Oh, he's not, ah, there he is. Okay, good man. Um, so for members of the public who are watching, Anthony is our architect on this project. And this is a development permit, which is really we're looking at form and character for the design of the mixed use building that's going to be affordable units and uh, city hall on the ground floor. So first of all, I need a mover. It will be to make the motion that staff has put forward here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I will read the part that says that we issue a development permit for the proposed development uh, located at, 20, at 1923rd Avenue with the legal description, and that it will be a mixed-use building comprised of affordable housing units and city hall on the ground floor, and it's subject to the conditions A through I. And those A through I are in the agenda ahead of, ahead of you all. Although, hmm, should I read these out? Because the public probably can't see that. Hmm. The public would normally either have their own copy in front of them or not, if yeah. we were in the miners' hall. Yes, that's true. That's true. Well, I'll, I'll paraphrase them really quickly. So A is that the dimensions and siting of the building are in the substantial accordance to the drawings we've seen. That landscaping is going to be screening parking and to ensure visual privacy, separation of neighboring properties that C is that the applicant posts uh, within the city, uh, with the city, a landscape performance security deposit, that there will be a statutory right of way for a pathway, that the applicant complies with the requirements, the city's engineer regarding upgrades needed to service the development, that there's a, a statutory right of way for existing infrastructure locations, that a sidewalk is constructed along third and along Spokane, that where possible existing trees surrounding the site are maintained, and that the applicant confirms with the city the best location for garbling, gar, <laughs> garbling, <laughs> garbage and recycling um, with, the, with the contractor. Okay, so that is the motion. I'll take a mover. Janice moves, a seconder, Chris seconds, and now some discussion. Do we have some discussion on this? Are there any questions from council? We've got Anthony here to answer anything you might want to know. Okay, no hands up. Okay, well, wait, Janice, yes. Anthony makes nice buildings. Anthony makes nice buildings. Yes, we, we agree that Anthony makes. Oh, Anthony, I do have a question for you. I'm going to put you on the spot. And if you don't know, that's okay, because I didn't know either. There was some question about the height of the building, how it compares to the height of RSS and the height of the arena. And I remember you saying, because the, 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 the floors aren't really giant, it's not like we have 12 foot tall ceilings or whatever, that the building itself is not actually going to be that monstrous compared to those other large buildings. Do you remember the, de the height of those other buildings? Uh, I can't, well, I don't have the, the, the actual amounts, but when I was uh, last in Ross and I looked at the school and I, I think uh, per floor was about four feet higher per floor than, than ours. Cause we're looking at 
nine foot ceilings for the residential. And I think it was about 14 or so for the, for the school. So when I, when I kind of judged it without actually taking measurements, it looked like it was a similar height ov overall. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's kind of what I remembered, but I wrote that on social media and then I went, Oh, I'm probably going to get killed for that because I didn't back it up with an actual fact. Okay. Any other questions on this? And as we know, and as we've been quite clear in the public is that this is just one step of many steps before this project gets to construction phase. We've got more drawings to do, more approvals to do, more all kinds of things, and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So anything could happen. This is not a guarantee that the project will go forward, but it is us not stopping it because we have not heard any compelling arguments that are against it. Um, on the merits, it is a huge benefit to our community, both of providing affordable housing and providing an adequate space for City Hall, give us more tax dollars and all those arguments that we, that we all know about. So this is your chance, guys. Anything else of the development permit? We'll call the question on it. All in favor? All in favor? Andy can't see hands. Okay. Chris, Chris, had a, Chris had a hand up for a question earlier. Oh, Chris, did you? I'm sorry. Well, it wasn't necessarily a question, Kathy, and, you know, I've been very close to this uh, for the duration of the project, and, and the architects and Anthony and, and your team, they've done an excellent job in capturing and rendering the needs of our community. Combined with the goal of available, affordable, and livable housing, it's a fit, uh, along with the cost-effective, innovative plan for the new City Hall. Um, I mean, I think, and as mentioned many times, the building will be unprecedented in our province as it works to provide a, a service combined with a consistent and reliable future revenue for our city in, in the form of positive res residential tax. Um, yeah. It also props up our OCP supported by our sustainability plan and provide us with 37 much needed and spoken about affordable housing so units. So awesome. Nicely said, Chris. Thank you. Okay, then um, I think I did call the question, right? I think we, we passed it. We're good. Anthony, thank you. Thanks. All right. Yep. We'll see you later. Okay, back to our regularly scheduled agenda. We are now looking at, this is a referral from a prior meeting, petitions and delegations. This was the delegation we had from the Chamber of Commerce from the Trail and District of which Roslyn is a member. They're looking for some financial support. So uh, staff is looking for more direction. So this is gonna open it up. Somebody wants to make a motion and we can discuss it and we'll go from there. Uh, Janice. I'd like to make, oh, I don't need to lean forward. Why do I keep doing that? Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we support the uh, Trail and District Chamber of Commerce along with our own businesses uh, with a sum of $5,000 for this year and see how that works out for us. Okay, do I have a seconder? Seconder. Andy seconds. Okay, good. Uh, let's discuss it. Janice. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, the chamber and with uh, with the pandemic, we've seen lots of emails coming around about um, how businesses are trying to cope with this, what's happening to them. Um, I think in our community, we're actually quite lucky. We have a great local um, we have a great local uh, residential base that really supports our local businesses. We have relationships with them. Certainly other communities aren't doing as well. Um, so I see the chamber as providing advocacy on behalf of our business community uh, with other levels of government, the region, the province, the federal government, um, providing a two-way flow of information, both to our businesses from council about what the city's doing, what the city is expecting, what our city plans are, but also back to us with information about our businesses that we're not currently necessarily getting, uh, which adds capacity and lets us make better decisions about some of the things that will affect our business. And it also supports, uh, it also supports our goal of increasing um, regional cooperation because the Trail District of uh, District of Cha Chamber of Commerce <laughs> is, uh, is uh, certainly looks after businesses from Rossland, currently looks after and advocates for businesses all the way from Rossland, all the way down through the valley, out to Fruitvale and Beaver Valley. Um, so it's just, another, it's just another group that helps us to be more cohesive regionally. That's my spiel. Okay, good one. Andy. I put my hand up to support um, it on the floor. I'm not so sure it's the best use of uh, funds um, for this application, 
my concern was that uh, for one thing, it, things have totally changed uh, um, from a business sense in the last two weeks, uh, even from the time they were here to make their appeal. And I am concerned that um, uh, our business communities, um, though, uh, I guess I'm support, I'm concerned about the support that they get through the Chamber of Commerce. I, I, I talking to and, and chatting with businesses, and maybe Chris can provide some insight here in the community. Uh, previously, there wasn't a lot of buy-in when it came to the local chamber. Um, and so I don't know if that's changed. Maybe it has. Um, and I don't know, uh, to be honest, I, I think it's going to be community by community. Having a regional application of, of this uh, funding um, or this organization may not be as effective in the short term or even the medium to longer term, whereas something specific to rosin, I think is gonna be really critical from a business standpoint. Uh, Cause I think community by community, it's gonna be um, working, you know, individually the communities are gonna to work together in the businesses. I wouldn't mind Chris's uh, thoughts about that just cause uh, being, being in a business himself, businesses himself, and also having an ear to, to a number of other ones in the community. So I haven't, uh, I haven't decided yet whether I'm gonna support it. Okay, well, um... Dirk actually has his hand up, so I'm going to call on Dirk first, and then Chris. Oh, no, then Stuart. Stuart has his Stu, hand up. Stuart had his up before me. I don't know if he wants to go first. He didn't on my screen. Doesn't matter. Somebody talk. I'll talk. I, I'm okay. happy to defer. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't pretend to know exactly whether they're relevant to the business community in Rosalind. Um, I would appreciate some perspective on that. Maybe we should ask them. Um, but just from the presentation they made at our last meeting, I don't think they made the case that they were relevant to Roslyn businesses, and I didn't think their funding formula made any sense. Um, you know, I'd be reluctant to support them until we'd actually done some outreach to our business community and thought, you know, is, is this something that's useful to them and are they, are they looking to, for support from, from the city? Okay. Um, all right, so Dirk, your hand is still up. Yeah, and uh, pretty much Chris, what you said. Chris, Chris can, you, can you put your hand up? Okay, because we've got these little I, blue I can on the thing. Okay, okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll go after Dirk, I'm ready. Okay, Dirk. Uh, my comment was pretty much the same as Stu's. I didn't get the benefit of seeing the presentation last time, but I would prefer to reach directly to our businesses to see. Okay, uh, Chris. You know, historically, the the Chamber of Commerce really has, you know, in, in its infancy when Eric was the the leader there, and there were a lot of great things that the Chamber was doing. Um, it kind of got overshadowed by the real kind of commerce in our town, which is tourism, and the and the and tourism. Rosslyn and the Chamber were working very closely together in those days. So um, when tourism pulled off, the chamber kind of fell away when Renee was running it. She did a good job, but it just wasn't as relevant as the, the businesses were, were crying for, okay, what is happening with tourism? Like the people that are coming are our lifeblood. So um, it created our local businesses, uh, it didn't create a monster really, but it, 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 it allowed them to become a lot more business savvy with with what they do and, and how they go to market, where they're going for things like um, employee benefits, uh, marketing plans. Um, and they really kind of emulated what Tourism Rosslyn was doing at that time. So um, the chamber fizzled out here and people had a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth because they really weren't doing anything other than the rekindle event, which I believe should stay in Rosslyn. So <laughs> you know, I think it's a good retail thing. Um, off topic. Uh, so there's really not a good history of love with the, with the chamber. Um, now, that being said, the new chamber and what we're facing now with businesses kind of being scared, you know, they need a place where they, I think, can go and, and you know, at least reach out to for some guidance as to how to rebuild. So couple that with what, um, you know, economic development is doing as well as what uh, um, uh, Community Futures is doing, embarking on that. So um, I think that and I, and I, Janice, you're giving them five grand, we can find that with us not going to AG, ABLG, sorry. 
Um, so the money could be there. Um, and I, I appreciate Alma's response in, in we'd have to find the money. Every other place has to come to us once a year and ask for the money. So to actually find it now in time of need for our community as well, I don't know if that's really right. Um, I'd really like to see a way better presentation to that point. They put forth to us the other day just asking for 7200 bucks. Um, so I'd support the, the give to them. Um, if they need it now to survive, then that's a different story. But I'd really like to see a better presentation when it comes to us giving out money to everybody. Okay, Janice. Yeah, thanks. No, I, uh, I, I took away from the presentation that they were struggling and did need some local support. They'd never asked for it before um, to move forward through this next calendar year. Um, and I do recall that when we had a Rawson Chamber of Commerce, that the city supported them up until they, uh, until they folded with $12,000 a year. So this is a, it's a less expensive alternative. Well, I thought it was more than that. I thought it was like $30,000 a year. Hold on one second. I got to turn on a light. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I can't read my notes. Okay. That's better. Okay. Yeah. No, I, the last time, uh, the last one that I saw it was 12,000. I mean, that might've been as it was declining mm -hmm. in uh, relevancy. Uh, but this is a different group of people. Uh, you know, I see them doing their, their uh, business after business meetings that seem well, they're hosting uh, seminars, they're promoting events um, throughout the region. It's, I don't think we should give it to them on an annual basis, but I would or commit to giving it to them on an annual basis. Um, but given that they may be able to assist our businesses to get through this situation and come out of the other side thriving, I'd like us to consider it. But I'm okay with deferring it too. So I had, I had an interesting sort of, you know, journey on thinking about this. When I first heard the presentation, I was like, well, fine, but come to us during when we do community support. And that, would have been, that was my position, that we should invite them to come back in October, make a presentation about what, you know, what have they done for us lately kind of thing. I do feel that the new people that are running it are way more dynamic than it has been for the last couple of years. And I do go on these weekly calls with them. They've just started them. Um, as a response to the COVID-19 thing where they invite business people on and they invite uh, political people on and they invite, you know, Community Futures and Lower Columbia Initiatives Corporation. There's a, there's a whole group and they talk about, um, you know, how to, how to deal with the crisis, how to recover from the crisis, what's next. And I think they are showing a, a valuable, you know, a valuable uh, um, service there, right? Whereas I, I really did not believe the chamber when it, the last few years it was in Roslyn that, that it was valuable at all, which is one of the reasons that, that it didn't exist anymore. So anyway, I kind of went this full circle from saying, no, I wasn't that impressed with the, with the presentation they did at our last meeting. And that was two weeks ago, which seems like two years ago now. But now I'm thinking I do see them doing a lot to help business. And we do have, what, what did they tell us? Wasn't it like 60 or 70 Roslyn members, I think, out of their 240 of their regional, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, so they have a pretty good chunk of our local business. So I came back around and thinking, yeah, I'd, I'd probably support giving them some money now. And, but on just sort of as emergency funds and then to say, you know, they'd need to come back and justify any further money as community support. But I think the, these are very unsettled times for business. So, and they and they do seem to be doing quite a bit of work. They're a great clearinghouse for for all kinds of information that people need links to, you know, lots of stuff. So, so anyway, okay. So, anybody else want to speak to that? We have a motion on the floor to support them for five thousand dollars at this time. I'm going to call the question. All in favor of five thousand now? And uh, okay, and opposed. We didn't. Too. Okay, so that carries and we will have to find the money um, somewhere and we will turn that over to Elmo to find to see if the, using the money that we're not using for our conference budget is the right place to take it from or, or whatever. Okay, okay, moving on. We are in. Yeah, Mark, just real quick, there's a, um, Elmo has a question. Oh, yeah. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Do you want to use uh, part of the money that you had labeled as contingency in the, in the community support area? Well, that's true. We did have contingency in there. Um, can you remind me how much that contingency was? Yeah, a few thousand, I think. 
less than five, that's for sure. Yeah. So that would use it all up, or do you want to leave, keep that aside and just use fry from somewhere else? Yeah, well, I, don't, I think we should take it from the council conference budget. So, yeah. Council, are you okay with that? Because we yeah. know we've got money in there that we haven't used and we're not going to be using it. Yeah, that's great. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, moving on, we have a policy on coronavirus disease, our pandemic policy. And the motion is that we approve the policy as presented to us by staff. Can I get a mover? Dirk moves, Stuart seconds. Any discussion on this? I think it's, <laughs> it's reasonable, that's for sure. Okay, all in favor? Hands up so I can see them. There, good, okay. Um, yeah, it's important you guys we put your hands up so they're like kind of like right in front of your face. So, cause Cynthia's, Cynthia's watching in there too. And hopefully Cynthia, that's working for you. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. Next up, we have a zoning amendment bylaw 2718 be adopted. This is the short term rental proposal over there. It seems on Leroy seems such a quaint little thing to be thinking about in the days of the pandemic, but let's go for adoption. Who wants to move it? Andy and Janice, all in favor? Okay. Adoption, not much to discuss at that point. Okay. Here is our municipal ticket information bylaw 2721. This is also up for adoption. Do I have a mover? Mover. Stuart moves it and Chris seconds it. Any discussion on our ticket bylaw? All in favor? Okay. Okay, now this is an interesting one. We have got our bylaw penalty relief measures during COVID-19. So this is the emergency measures that we were talking about. And the motion is that council waives the business license fines for not being in possession of a valid business license. And the part that says equal to double the applicable fee operating with an expired license subject to the additional penalty of $300 for the year 2020. Do I have a mover for this relief? Dirk says yes. Chris seconds it. Any discussion on that? Got any comments? Oh, good. I like it. I did not. Yeah, I think it's good. Okay, and Dirk moved it. Do you have anything there? Yeah, Janice? Yes. Actually, I don't like it. <laughs> and I don't like it because the term for the business license is January 1st to December 31st. And so the businesses who don't haven't bought their licenses yet are already delinquent. So we're actually punishing the businesses that got off their butts and bought, got their licenses renewed or bought their licenses in January um, and letting the people who just drifted off and ignored it, um, letting them off scot-free with no penalty, no... Yeah, we're, 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 in, we're encouraging bad behavior. So now I, this is maybe a question for staff. Do we have any idea how many people have paid their business licenses? Like these are... Yeah, that's right. Okay. These are 2020. Uh, do we have any idea how many people have purchased their licenses at this point? Um, this, it was about 20% that hadn't paid when I did the report. I'm not sure what it is right now. Hmm. Yeah, Janice makes a good point. So really, yes. if we were going to be fair, if we were going to be fair, we would refund the 20% that have paid their, paid their 80%. Oh, the eight, I'm sorry, the 80% that have paid their fees. So, Dirk. Oh, you're on mute. Dirk, I think you have to unmute. There, there we go. Okay. My space bar is not working for some reason. Um, but uh, for, I mean, businesses like me, I'm not as affected by this. I, if we're going to refund, it should be storefront businesses that are directly affected by COVID, not the likes of myself. I don't know how you separate that out, but there's no need to give them all back because we're not all hurting in the same way. Yeah, that's true. Ooh, that's a sticky one. Uh, Andy. Well, my thought was that, um, that as, as Dirk had said, the storefront that are directly, directly uh, affected by this crisis should be the ones to get any refunds or uh, some kind of a buy at this point. Um, the fact that Janice pointed out that, that the 
you know, 20% haven't paid and it wasn't, had nothing to do with, it, with the uh, current situation. And I think that uh, we should continue to go after those business licenses. And then as a separate item, we should decide uh, how we wish to support our storefront folks. And really, I, I don't know what other businesses might be affected. Um, and I, I realize that gets into a challenging area for staff as well. Maybe, maybe uh, Elma might, might have a suggestion here um, uh, uh, how to deal with this, but I think we should, personally think we should still go after our business licenses. Elma, do you have anything to comment on that? I've got some other hands up here, but I'm just thinking if you've got a thought. Well, I don't like refunding everybody that's paid. I don't think that's a good idea. A CFO uh, never wants to give back money. <laughs> Um, maybe uh, instead of doing, let's say, 100% for the people that haven't paid yet, um, maybe you could just waive one penalty instead of both of them. Would that be a solution? And think of something else to do for the rest of business. I don't really know what, you know, that's going to be hard, right? I mean, there's businesses that are doing business and there's businesses that aren't, right? Like Mount, Mountain Nugget is still doing business. Paws, House of Paws is still doing business. They're kind of closed, but they're kind of open. You know, Powder Hound is closed. Like, it's, the, I think if you do one and not the other, that's kind of, uh, you know, you're treading on uh, thin ice there. Right. Well, we're, try we're trying to be fair, right? We're trying to be fair. So, you know, as, as Janice mm -hmm. pointed out, giving a benefit to the people who were the bad behavior but were rewarding bad behavior so that's not a good that's not a good solution but okay I'm going to call on Stuart and then Chris yeah I'd just like to support Janice in that I'd rather see any subsidy we provide targeted to people who are actually suffering because their businesses aren't operating you know I mean there are numerous federal and provincial sort of benefit programs in place. So perhaps we could piggyback on, on one of those. You know, we don't, perhaps don't have the resources to, to vet who isn't, isn't eligible for something, but we could see something amongst the, the whole list of things that I identified that are available to local businesses and perhaps say, look, if you, you know, qualify for one of these measures of assistance, then you can have your business license refunded or, or whatever relief we, we can provide, but I'd, I'd like to see something targeted. Mm -hmm. That's a good not, idea. Not just, not just something blanket. Right, that's a good idea. Chris? Yeah, um, I don't like it as much as I used to. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Janet. Um, but, to, and Janet, to, the, to that point, you're absolutely right. And, and to Alma's point, I don't like giving money back either. As a business, I've already paid, like it's already in the bank and on the budget and all the things that go with that. Um, However, with the times that we have now, a lot of things are getting deferred. So why don't we just defer the penalty, send out new letters to them all and saying, okay, you know what? You still owe your business license uh, money and you will owe a penalty once this all settles um, if we don't make arrangements with you to clear this up and put it back into their court and let them come back with it. Okay. Stuart, your hand is still up. Oh, sorry. Okay. I didn't all right. That's okay. Get a lower Janice. Janice and then Andy. I, I do like uh, Stuart's idea about piggybacking on a, a federal or provincial program so that if a company, if one of our businesses qualifies for one of their programs, then we can look at that and, uh, and help them out locally as well. So it is a targeted, and, uh, a targeted program to the people who need it. Yeah, we could refer it back to staff to find a program perhaps that matches given what Stuart has suggested, something like that. Andy, you had your hand up. Oh, that sounds all good to me now. Yeah. Okay. okay, so let's have a motion to that effect. Stuart or Janice, one of you makes it. Stuart, what's your motion? Um, that we look for, well, I'm not sure are we, well, are we looking to a, a, Direct staff, we can direct staff to find a, a federal or provincial program that would, we would use as the qualifier right, to, to get a refund of a uh, business license. Janice. Yes. You're muted. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I think we've already put the motion forward to uh, do the reward, I think. All right, we gotta vote on that. Gotta vote that yeah. We gotta vote that down first. Okay, yeah, we're gonna vote on the original motion that we waive the fines. So all in favor of that, 
Nobody. All opposed, anyone opposed? All of us. Okay, now, Stuart's got the next motion up for directing staff. Which is we'd find some federal or provincial program that's applicable to local businesses that are suffering due to closure in, the, in this COVID crisis and that we, we tie a refund of their business license for this year to that qualifier. Okay, and do we have a seconder? Janice seconds. Cynthia, do you have that? Cynthia's got it. Okay. All right. So any further discussion on that? I think that's a great idea. Have it more targeted. It's more fair. And we help the people we're trying to help. Um, okay. All in favor. Oh, Elma has a question. Oh, Elma has a question. Um, you know, we get into, it, it just might not be as simple as all that because not only is there the city of Rossland business license, there's also the intercommunity and the intermunicipal business license that people don't get through us, but get through the city of Trail or through our regional partners. And so we can't really refund that because the, you know, the money is shared between other municipalities. Mm. So this makes it a little bit more difficult. But maybe you want to cross that bridge later. Maybe we first find out what we can find out, and then we can we can cross that other bridge later. Yeah, that sounds good. Let's do a little work on it first. Andy, you had your hand up. You're muted. Yeah, I just uh, wanted another option is that again putting the onus back on the business owner that uh, anybody that um, feels that they want their that that they must prepay their business license regardless. But if they feel that they are it's onerous and that they could potentially apply back to the city for a refund of their business license value. I, just as just, just they would have to prove, to, you know, they're, uh, they're challenged and that they need, they need the funds to support their business. <coughs> it's another option. It, that one's a little cleaner. Uh, it doesn't require, you know, and, and I, I think it'd be kind of obvious well, who, who would be uh, eligible and who might, would be at that point. Well, tie, tying it to what Stuart was saying, tying it, if they're eligible for whatever provincial or federal program, they're eligible for that. If we say, yeah, if you're eligible for that, you're eligible for this, then that takes us having to even determine who's eligible and who isn't. Janice. Well, I was just going to say uh, to Elma's point, if we tie it into a city of Rossland business license refund so that, you know, we're not, we're not trying to refund uh, licenses that are inter-area. Well, I think we should just, we've, we've referred this back to staff and maybe let's let clever Elma come up with something and come back to us um, and see what, what works. Is that all right? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be a make or break amount for our local businesses. It's a small gesture. If we, if we can do it, great. If we can't, then, well, do that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think we voted on that, right? A but in the meantime, we're going after we're going after the rest of our business licenses, correct? Yes. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're moving on to our audited financial statements. This is that we approved City of Roslyn's 2019 audited financial statements as presented. And as Kirsten said, they were so well done. Um, so take a mover on that. Janice moves it. A seconder. Andy seconds. Okay. Any discussion on this? Questions? Jens. I am honored to move Elma's excellent work <laughs> in our financial department, <laughs> especially after hearing the high praise from the auditor. So thank you so much for everything you do, Elma. That's right. And I want to add to that because I've been through quite a number of these where they were not as uh, pretty as this. Three-page management letters about how screwed up things were, but that's another story. Okay, so Andy, did you have something on that? Did you want to say something? No, okay. Okay, anything else there? Stuart. Yeah, I just wanted to make the point that, I mean, I've, I've read through all the material and, and understood it as well as I can, but I'm, I'm not a, a trained accountant. And, you know, when, when, I, when I could hear the language from the, the accountants saying that, you know, it's our obligation to provide you know, the accountability of making sure these things are above board. I mean, you know, I mean, I can only do what I can do. I mean, it, it passes the sniff test and I've read through it and understood it as best I can, but I'm not claiming to, to, to understand all the financial terms. 
No, I think that's why we have auditors, that they're there to look and see. And if there's any anything that, as they say, material issues, right, they bring them up and then well, they, what... they require management to come back and address them. And there were those three little things. But... Well, that, that's just what I just want to clarify, that I'm relying on yes. the auditor and staff to, to give good advice on these things. I'm not claiming to understand it at that level where I can, you know, if, if there's malfeasance out there that someone's part trying to run something by me, they probably can because I don't understand it that well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Did you make a note of that, Elma? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's on it. He's on it. I, I just got to know my limits. Well, and you know what? It's a, that's a really good point, Stuart. That's a really good point. And honestly, unless we were all accountants and auditors on council, that's that's true of all of us, right? I mean, there there are some who have a better understanding than others, and and you know, so yeah, so that 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 does come down to trust. But part of having the trust in our staff is that we still have to do an audit, right? And sure. that's where things would get would get caught. And believe me, in the past, they they have certainly. So it it works. The system does work. Um, so, but I you know, hopefully we're not staying up late at night worrying about the numbers that because they're right right We're hoping. okay okay so all in favor of of adopting okay we've approved good okay now we're flipping over to the sophie supplemental statements of financial information that we approve these um take a motion on that chris you haven't had your hand up for a while oh but andy beat you to it so andy and then chris any comments on this questions okay that's another one that used to really bug me because the SOFI wasn't included in the audited reports to council. It was always ended, you know, you'd see it later and the public didn't see it. And I, uh, in the old, in the bad old days. So it's really nice that this is exactly where it should be, which is in the public, in the public eye. Okay, any, no other, oh, Andy? Oh, you're muted. I wondered, I wondered about, um, Elma, just, just to confirm that the SOFI includes both uh, gross income and also expenses. Um, to, for that, for that minimum requirement, that seventy-five thousand they talk about on that report, um, it's the cumulative of the of the two that bring it over, uh, that required to be made public. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Okay. So, and and the expenses are, um, what what surprised me a little bit is the expenses are part of the are part of that amount, kind of part of the you know that they they are considered income. I guess is what I wondered. Yeah, yes, so we, the, it's what, how the legislation prescribes it, that 75000 hasn't changed in, oh, I don't know, for 16 years. So, you know, the, um, you know, there's been talk in the municipalities that the threshold should be raised, but the provincial government uh, hasn't yet. So those are, we're doing it according to their legislation. So that's why it is the way it is. Yeah, it has been interesting that it has been the same, although salaries have not stayed static. So you get more and more people coming on to that yeah. list, right? Yeah. Okay, so all in favor? We'll vote on this. We did. Okay, good. Okay, now we have the financial plan. This is our, our first reading of the financial plan, the 2020 to 2024, first reading. We'll adopt this later, but this is going to be first reading. So get a mover, mover, somebody, one of you, Chris and Janice. Okay, so want some discussion on the financial plan. The other thing that we're gonna look at here is that um, if we wanna provide any further direction on the property tax rate. So we're gonna have the discussion about, about that too. I mean, we can, this is a question for staff, we can do our first reading and then we can have that discussion. And when it comes back to us for second reading, any of those changes would happen, right? Is that how yes. you guys want to see it? Yes. Okay. So first of all, just we want to do first reading and then we can get into the discussion about the further direction. Okay. Everyone okay with that? Anyone have any comment about first reading? And we'll just vote on first reading and then move on. Okay. All in favor of first reading? Okay. Okay. And now, so we've, we've passed first reading. So now we need a motion or we don't need a motion, but we're going to have a little discussion here about further direction that we want to do. And there were several scenarios presented um, we are now up on, I don't know if I'm going to get it to the page in here. 
This is hard for me. I don't have my computer up here. I've got to put through the pages here to get to Elmer's report. Um, 171. Thank you. Um, okay, so anybody want to suggest one of the scenarios or discuss anything about the scenarios or keep things the way they were? I'm looking for, okay, Dirk. Muted. Hold on. There you go. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, that's much uh, better. I, you can't ha I can't unmute it unless it's the front program. That makes sense. Um, I like the moderate one versus the minimum or maximum sensitivity. Okay. And the moderate, that was the 0% increase. So do you want to make a motion that that is the one that we do? We'll get a seconder and discuss it. You're mu muted again. Did I do that to you? You're... Oh, there we go. There you go. Uh, yeah, I'll make a motion that uh, that's the one, the moderate one. Zero percent increase. Okay, yep. do we have a seconder? Seconder to discuss it? And I'll, okay, I'll second it to discuss it and then start in, Dirk. Uh, not a lot to discuss. I think it's a good move by the city and it's not a massive fluctuation. Okay. And Janice, you had your hand. Yes, Janice. And then yeah, um, I mean, I do note over time that, uh, that it reduces the city's capacity by 611,000 over the life of the, of the financial plan. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's not a significant amount of support to every household. Keeping in mind, it's not every person, it's every household. It's, uh, you know, on average, we can only discuss averages, it's $52. Um, and uh, it's not targeted. So it'll be a blanket move that uh, gives households that some won't need any help for whatever reason, um, but they'll also get that discount. Um, so for myself, thinking it through, um, I would rather stay the course with the 2.5, uh, knowing that we can change our spending, change our stuff down the road, um, and we're not, we're not reducing our capacity in the future to look after our community. So it seems like a win-win to be able to look after um, people now and people later. Well, and Janice, the thing that you brought up that I, that I think was, was really important and something that we, we really need to talk about is that um, property tax deferral program that the province already has, because that's where you're going to get the targeted help. Like I was, I was all in for, the, for like the 0% or maybe even going, going down, um, but then, look, then when, we got, when we got almost charts about how much that was going to impact the city, um, it's huge, right? It's huge. So anyway, yeah, go ahead. Okay, well, here I go then. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, the BC Property Tax uh, Deferment Program, I'll try and be as quick as I can, although I would, failed entirely being concise in my email. Uh, it, it's available to, they have two separate programs. One is, they call it the regular program. It's anyone who's 55 this year and older. And then they have a family and children's program, which is available to anyone with families uh, with children, obviously, under minor children, but also children in post-secondary. Uh, so actually, if you timed your kids the right way, you could just defer your taxes forever. Um, <laughs> uh, it is, it, you know, it's, the what I like about it is that if we promote that and we get that out to people, there's no means test. Um, they do have to have a certain amount of equity in their property to take advantage of it. So there may be some people who aren't able to take advantage of it that way, uh, but it provides um, property owners with uh, a tax deferral over all taxing authorities. So not just municipal tax, the regional, their school tax, their hospital tax, everything. Um, they pay simple interest, so they never pay interest. It's not compounded on the interest charge. They just pay interest on what the actual deferment value is. Um, for children, for families with children, there's no, um, there's no administration fee at all. Um, the regular program does require you to have 25% of your 
assessed value of your house available for credit. So, and they would look at things like mortgages or home <laughs> equity line, lines of credit. Um, the, as Elma pointed out, which I was not aware of, is the family's one uh, requires 15%. So it's a little bit more lenient. And, you know, our average household, if they applied for that, if we help them apply for that program and get set up, they'd actually get a $4,000 break this year. We can't really, we can't provide someone with $4,000 of support. I did a really quick, I was thinking about this and I thought, all right, you know, so if we went around the room and looked at all of us, uh, I looked at, there's 12 of us. So I looked at, um, I counted Sarah because I just did it as if we were sitting in the minors hall. So Sarah, myself, Andy, Kathy, and Darren, even though he only barely qualifies this year, could all apply for it on the 55 or over program in the regular program. Um, Chris, Dirk, Brian, Cynthia, um, Elma, and Stacy all have kids at home. They could all apply for it. So the only person that we're missing is Stuart because he's too young and he doesn't have kids. But you will get old. <laughs> but the argument for that is, so out of a group of 12 of us, only one of us, notwithstanding equity requirements, doesn't qualify for it. So as a city, instead of giving everybody $50, if, all, if things go totally sideways, we all upload this problem to the provincial government. What a how often do we get to do that? And then meanwhile, Stuart, who doesn't qualify for the program, instead of giving him $50, we give him $500. And we still be spending less money. Stuart, what do you think of that? I, that all seems very fair. Um, <laughs> I, I also noted that the, the two things that, that convinced me about sort of supporting where Janice is going on this were her figures about the... the, the the types of businesses and individuals in the community that, that are being affected at the moment and those that aren't, you know, I don't think we have accurate stats, but it seemed like a reasonable estimate to think that at least three quarters of the community are currently, you know, unaffected by the, the current situation. Um, and also in the, the weekly information package we had, which detailed all the federal and provincial and otherwise relief programs that have been established for people that are genuinely suffering. Um, uh, and I counted 23 different programs. Um, they, they seem fairly comprehensive. Um, and the government has recently said that they're planning to even expand it so that there are nobody falls through the cracks. So, you know, I, I, I think given all those options of, the, of what Janet just detailed was just one of them, perhaps we should be, you know, helping people in the community to know about all these opportunities to make sure they actually are in, well informed and are taking full advantage of them. And that if as a community we were, were looking to provide relief, you know, I'd, back to our earlier point, I'd, I'd like to see it targeted rather than just some, some general discount to, you know, what, what seems to be, you know, three out of four people probably don't even need it at the moment if we, if we went along this route. Okay, Dirk and then, and then Janice. I think, and I, I looked at that uh, information that Janice had provided, and I, I think that the 20% that were identified there would be hit hard enough that the targeted approach works. But the reality is... Um, I'm not targeted or not impacted enough that I need that kind of help, nor would I want to defer, but uh, I haven't talked to a single person yet that's not impacted relatively significantly. I've talked to contractors who've had to lay a couple people off. Those people will get some, but it impacts their bottom line. Uh, you know, we were planning a renovation. We just couldn't do that anymore. And that's impacted a number of people that don't have storefronts, but we're going to be working on labor on the house, uh, general, that's all been put off. So I think I, I would hazard a guess that 80 to 90% of the people in town are impacted in some way. And for me, this is a, a nice town, not a nice town gesture, but a, a good contributing to the community. Hey, we're all in a crisis. 
kind of idea that does, it's not going to make a difference other than, you know, 10 nice coffees for me, but it does, I am impacted. And I think others outside of that 20% of storefronts are impacted as well. I would, I would agree with you that, that, that a lot of people are impacted far more than just the list based on, on the job things that, that Janice had sent around for sure. I'm just not sure. And, and from an optics point of view, yeah, being able to say, yeah, we're, we're not raising taxes at all. It's a 0% increase. From an optics point of view, it looks good. But when you look at what it ends up costing us, costing the municipality over the five years, the $611,000, that's a, that's a lot, right? Whereas, you, you know, you may get a, a fifty or hundred dollar, you know, benefit kind of thing. But does that really justify going the other way? Okay, Janice and then Andy. Uh, well, I was just going to say that from a from a city point of view, this is a great program to promote because it's similar to the homeowner grant in that we still get the entire um, tax um, requisition that we need to meet our budget from every every household, whether they claim the program, whether they claim the uh, deferral or not. Um, I had another point. It was a really good one. I lost it when I was looking for the word deferral. Um, oh, so sorry. I That's had a good okay. point. You, you think about it. You think about it and Andy will make his point. Yeah, mine was uh, related specifically to the, um, the idea that uh, we could potentially look at just a one-year uh, deferral. Um, so it's zero percent because the rea reality is every year we look at our our tax rates um, and we choose accordingly. Uh, so uh, that's 600,000 was based on a five year plan, correct Janice? So um, what would the impact be of a single year, for example, at 0%? Well, yeah. Janice. That was actually, Elma worked that out and she can confirm this, I'm sure, much better yeah. than I can. But my understanding was that was based on um, the difference between collecting 2.5 steadily across five years and doing zero this year and then going back to 2.5 next year. Yeah, that's that's what it was. If you yeah, look at 171, one. look at 171. So yeah. um, Elma, do you want to do you want to chime in here? Well, it it's just more than this year. You have to look at because it compounds, right? So the amount of revenue that's collected next year, it's on a lesser amount because you lowered it to 0%. And then the year after that, it's going to be less. And the year after that, it's going to be less. And that's how you end up with $600,000 over a time frame, right? Okay. I've totally lost track. I've got hands from Stuart. And I know I've got Janice and Dirk and Andy also. Andy, you just spoke. So maybe yours was there. But yeah. I, between the other three of you guys here on my, on my Jeopardy board here. No. Okay. So Stuart, were you, did you have something? No, I just keep forgetting to take my hand down. Okay, okay, okay. That's good. That's good. Janice, then. Janice. Okay, I remember, I remember the point I was going to make, which is <laughs> that I, once, we, once we set our tax rate, it's set in stone. So if we decide to reduce our tax rate to the moderate amount, to the maximum flexibility, and then three months from now, the world totally goes back to normal, we can't change that. If we keep our tax rate where it is in the world, we, have, we end up with the worst case scenario, we can move all the money around. I mean, we can collect it and give it back. Not that our CFO likes that, um, but, um, but we can, right? So the only, when we set our tax rate, it really is set in stone. Once we've set it, that's it, we're done. Um, our spending forecasts or our spending plans can be moved around. Our reserves can be moved around. All those things can be amended within our budget, which gives us a lot more flexibility. We really don't know what's going to happen. True. Um, Elma, do you want to comment on that? And then I'm going to go to Stuart. Uh, no, I think that's what, what Janice says is true. Okay, Stuart. And you know, I think if we looked at it as $650,000, there's a lot of good we could do in a, in a lot of ways if we needed to. Uh, if, if you know, in a worst case scenario where there was genuine hardship in the community, you know, I mean, we you know, we could choose to spend six hundred fifty thousand dollars in, in in a lot of targeted ways to do a lot of good, as opposed to just distributing a fifty dollar refund to everybody in the community right now. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. it, the only concern I had about it is that let's say somebody they're, they're usually fine paying their taxes. They don't have a problem, but they do have a problem. This year. And so this year they defer it, but then next year they don't need to defer it anymore. It's like, you don't have to pay it back until the house changes hands. Right. But if you do, wait a minute, let me just finish. And then you tell me if I'm right or wrong. But if, if you do decide you don't want to keep deferring it, then you owe it then right so if somebody defers it this year and then they decide next year they don't need the deferral anymore so now they owe taxes for two years at once is that correct or no no, no. that's not correct if you uh Which runs with your title yeah it, it goes on the title of the property so unless you're changing the title oh, and that's got, one of the it, got it oh mm. yeah so if you yeah i know <laughs> if so you know if you defer it this year because you need to you don't defer it for the next 10 years it it you just get simple interest so annual interest on it and um you can either pay it back as you choose to or just pay it back when the title changes on the house so okay. there are i mean there's certainly some you know there's certainly some qualifications there's some things that people want to think about if they're close to retiring if they have some uh succession planning going on they want to make sure they kind of have their title all the way it needs to be before they apply because it does restrict some of the things they can do without having to pay that back right away. Okay. But yeah, if they don't need to defer next year, they don't have to pay it back. Okay, that's good. I, I misunderstood that part of it. So that's great. Okay, so we have a motion on the table. Does anyone have anything else they want to say about this discussion? The motion on the table is that we do the 0% increase for this year as a goodwill gesture to the community. No other comments on that. We'll take another mm -hmm. motion afterwards, but I will. Oh, Stuart? Yeah, I'd just like to, I mean, you know, these 23 different programs that are available for people, including this one, you know, I, I think there's an opportunity for us to, to, you know, get those out there into the community so people that do understand what, what is available to them. That, Why don't you know, we vote many, many Let's vote on this motion, then we could talk a little bit more if we have any ideas about how we want to do that. Would that, okay. would that work? Yep. Anybody else want to say anything about this motion? Zero percent increase. All in favor? And uh, oh, okay, one in favor. Oh, wait a minute. Oh no. No. Okay. Okay. Dirk, you're in favor, right? Okay. And then opposed. Okay. So the motion fails. So now we have. Now is the time to have another motion about something. We could say we want to have Janice do a webinar about uh, about <laughs> deferrals or something about getting programs together. Janice has her hand up. What would you like? Yeah, I'll do a webinar <laughs> if Alma sits beside me and gives me the look when I start to say the wrong thing. <laughs> okay. Um, Stuart, did you have some ideas about how you want to communicate? Whether there's, a, there's a lot of resources. I mean, one of, the things that, one of the things about the chamber is the chamber has all of those programs for businesses and individuals, or lots of them there, and there's lots on the on the provincial websites. I mean, it, it's more just providing the links, I think. Yeah, we're not going to provide, you know, interpretation of these things, but, you know, I thought that was a, it wasn't as easy to, to sort through. It did take me a while to sort of sort through that package that we received. You know, there was page after page after page of, of various things that, that are available, but it wasn't that hard to summarize. And I, I think it would be a useful function to, to provide those links out there in the community. So that the, especially those people that, that are in need right now, they're not necessarily as savvy as they could be in, in accessing what's available. So any help we can provide would probably be a good thing. So are you thinking of the, the um, lists of all the programs that were in our information package? Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, we, we, have, we have an ability to communicate with people. We should use that to make sure that information is available. Right. Janice. Well, I'm just thinking about the effort we put into getting people to, uh, to participate in citizen budget. I mean, surely to save people $4,000 when they may be in financial distress, we can put in a similar, similar level of um, effort to make sure that they know what programs are available for them and where. Yes, but we have to social distance. We can't be standing in Ferraro. Right. Right yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah, we, we certainly could. So this is a question for staff. That, that is documents that were in our information package that was the big list, had the little COVID virus and the big list of all the different programs. Is that a document that we could just link onto our website and then all those links would be within? 
I'm sure we can. We've just spent the last like couple of days here getting ready for this meeting, and so we'll just to make sure we could get going with that. But most of the stuff that we get that's in the info package that we get from various agencies is added to our webpage. And when we have some more clear direction on what we're doing from the budget perspective, then we can probably send out a little bit of a circular press release update on that activity with some of these options that might be that we're talking about. Yeah, you know, we could do another thing where I do a message on part of it and the backside is all the different programs listed with the links for people to, for, to go to do. That would be good. Okay, so I think at this point, I have not heard us giving any other direction to staff about the financial plan. Oh, Dirk. I uh, just wanted to point out that our intrepid reporter has raised her hand. Oh shoot, I'm sorry. But but in the middle of the meeting, we don't actually we don't actually have people talk in the middle of the meeting. Now I can't get over to attendees here. Hmm, I'm only on panelists. Very, how come I can't get to attendees? I want to go see my attendees. I can see my panelists, but I can't see my attendees. Oh, maybe because it's minimized. Uh, she did put her hand down. So put her hand perhaps. down. Okay. Okay. Well, I will just make the comment that the time for comments, even in, yeah, I, I don't know what happened there. That didn't work. Um, maybe I'll put it down and try again. Um, the time for comments is in public input. Yeah, my screen is a little bit frozen here on that box. So I can't, I don't have that control, which I don't think matters too much. So I'm trying to get rid of it and I can't. Okay, Janice. Uh, do we need to make a motion to continue forward with the plan as laid out previously? Yeah. Uh, no, you mean our financial plan? No, because we passed first reading of it and we were, if we're going to do other direction, we would have done it now and that would have gotten fed into it and come back to us at second reading. So we don't, we're good. I just want to make sure that nobody does have, I mean, we're, we're not making these directions, but is there anything else that um, council would like to direct staff as regards to the financial plan of 2020-2024. Otherwise, we will see this again at our next meeting and it'll be second and third reading probably, okay? Okay, so we're pretty happy with it, everybody. I don't see any hands up and my screen is frozen anyway, so you have to wave right in front of my face if you want me to see something. Okay, so we're moving on. We are moving on to... Ooh, we are looking at the citizen budget results, the sequel. Um, so this is that we review the information and if we have further direction on, on the uh, financial plan, so this is another opportunity for us to give further, uh, further information to the, to the plan. I mean, you know, you look at that and you see the results. I think the, the most glaring thing was that trails was under um, funded based on the 114 people who did respond. So just saying, I'm not sure there was anything else that jumped out at me. Was there anything else that jumped out at anybody else? Want to talk about that? Yes, Janice. Love the new report, by the way. Thank you and Elma for that. Oh, um, the only thing that um, I actually had thought about it before the last time we talked about it and then, you know, skipped it was, I did notice that in some of the comments that uh, Elma forwarded to us that you know, it seems like people, even though we have the learn more tab there, um, it seems that people are either unwilling to delve a little bit deeper to look at the background financials, or maybe they're even, you know, possibly they're unable to decipher them adequately. So I would love to see, um, I would love to see net costs of facilities and services on the main page that people look at. Um, and when I, when I think about that, I think that the Miners Hall is an excellent um, example of that because certainly by the time we roll this around again, um, the Miners Hall cost to oper operate will be almost negated by the user fees and the lease and everything else. Um, and I think that's something people really need to understand. Uh, we are asking people about their, um, about how they want their taxes to support things in the community. And uh, when we give them the gross 
um, cost of something that does generate revenue, uh, we're really not indicating what they're paying and we're not giving credit to whatever it is, whether it's bylaw services or planning or the uh, building inspection department, we're not giving those services or facilities credit for the revenue that they generate. They bring in. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. But also be, given that we're, given that we're very strongly messaging our, uh, um, our desire to build a new city hall because it will generate revenue, it's also a bit more of a consistent message. Yeah, that's a good point. Elma, how hard would that be to, to uh, show things that way? Well, that would be very difficult. So there's two things to consider here. There's a lot of uh, calculations that go on in the background that uh, conform to the way that the software works. And so a lot of it's tied around our budget uh, the, and the assessment. Um, so it would definitely make it more complex to do something like that. It's also, you know, it ties in with uh, information that's audited. The budget is audited. The, you know, expenses are audited. And then, and so I try, whenever I do reports, I try to really adhere to numbers that were audited. Um, and in that way, it kind of, it always goes back to something that's been verified by an external source. And so that's why those other reports that show the net costs, they're more, they back up those audited numbers, like they're tied into it, but those numbers aren't audited themselves. So I just, you know, for me, it's just about, you know, putting numbers out there that have been verified by, by an external source. And it's not, you know, yeah, that's important to me. It's a principal thing. Yeah. Besides but from the fact that it would be very complicated to change the way that their program is set up. Right. But it would seem that as a municipality, as as a council and for the, and for the public, we, we would want to ultimately have, have those numbers to know well, what, in the there. Cost and what the revenue mm -hmm. is and, and. It's in there. It's provided on that, on that link, right? It's given as a separate report. It's just that everything that those calculations are based on are based on gross, not right. on net. Like, like that's a very uh, strong, you know, generally accepted accounting principle. You don't net costs out. You show the true gross revenue. You show the true gross expenses. You don't apply net one thing against the other because then you're not getting a true picture of that facility. So it actually works the opposite way from what you're saying. It's actually better to show things like their 100% revenue, their 100% cost, and you can show something else that shows, you know, the recovery on those things, but it's proper form to show the total amount so that, so that the external users of the information get the whole picture. That's why your financial statements are shown the way, way that they are, right? Because it's based on certain principles of doing things a certain way. So, Janice. Yeah, I think I... I mean, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying, Alma. I'm sure I'm just a little frustrated, um, as I know Kathy has been over the last few days, that, you know, we provide, I know that information is there, you've provided it, and you, we can't get people to look at it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like we yeah. need a, another summary report that just lists our facilities. I mean, it, it's, it's, I, I mean, it's almost a clerical function, right? You get, you have the reports the way the reports are and you have to go in manually and say, okay, these are our, you know, five or six or whatever the facilities that we're actually getting revenues from and, and do a summary for that. And that, and that gets communicated to the public somehow. But, I, but they have that, that report is there. That's, that link was there in the citizen budget. Well, <laughs> Dirk. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I think the reality of human nature is that people have biases and they stop reading when they get to something that supports their bias. And you could see that in the comments. Yeah. 
Yeah. True. Yeah, I would I would agree with that too. That that um, I I just I don't think people want that much information, uh, and 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 certainly won't take the time to look at it uh, uh, objectively. So I, I certainly see from from the results uh, that very much emotional decisions around picking favorites and such, and understandably. Uh, so you know from from the fact that we have a, a pretty good a reasonable amount of citizens that do chime in on this is great. Uh, it's a representation, but it certainly isn't, uh, you know, loudest voices always rise to the top, as we know. <laughs> yeah. Eric? Uh, just the, the one thing that was separate from this that struck me is the, the vast majority of people talking to me about city stuff are complaining about dogs and dog poop and trees and parking and yet defunding the bylaw enforcement seems to be the biggest priority. Well, the 114 people who participated in the citizen budget were not the people who complained about dog poop and parking tickets, right? I mean, that's the thing. When you only have 114 out of 2,800 electors, it, it's a skewed picture, you know, for sure. But, uh, but the thing that was interesting to me is that, okay, these 114, they cared enough and were interested enough to dive into it. And even there, they were pretty much happy, pretty much overall happy with our balance of how we spend money. So to me, that's pretty good, right? Janice. Oh, you're muted. Nope, you're still muted. Okay, there we go. Had there to click. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, realistically, um, even though it's a small sample, to have that many questions and only have two items with a wide variance, you know, trails going up and bylaws going down, is, uh, is pretty spectacular. Yeah. Okay, so I don't think there's really anything else unless we want to take something from this report and make a change to anything in the budget at this point. We'll just carry on. So this is the time if anyone wants to make a change to the budget. We could take, I mean, this, we are in June. Oh, no, we're not in June. We're in whatever we are in. We're in the end, April. I don't know if we're going to have more come. We could just say we'll put the our surplus into trails because trails did come up with more um you know interest just an idea so andy you're muted andy you're muted throwing that throwing that idea out um uh, i'd like to make a motion that we do consider that okay I'm taking the surplus out of that that fund and applying it to the trails okay uh, and i would think it was just less just less than five thousand dollars yeah, I think it, what, it, it, is that what it was? I thought Elma said it was $2,500. Uh, I can check. Yeah. Okay. And Chris was the seconder? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so Elma, can you check? You're checking now. I can't see you. Yes, I'm checking. So I was also suggesting, if we're having that conversation right now, that we have to have Councillor Spooner step away. Yeah, we probably should. Conflict of interest right now. Can I get some technical advice? How do I do that? Uh, just close your eyes and um, mute yourself. <laughs> I'll get myself a beer. Yeah, sure. <laughs> hey, you know what? I can mute him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. go get a beer. That's good. Um, yeah. I mean, honestly, we have heard so much about about that, and I think it makes sense too. But we'll see what the okay. amount there. So do you guys have a number in mind that you're thinking about or do you want to just go back to their original request that they asked for um, in the grant and aid program back in the uh, the late late December and look at that number again? Well, I don't think we have enough in our in our uh, excess, in our surplus to, to fund that. But let's see, Andy, you had your hand up? Yeah, I, I think, think it was... Uh, they were looking for an extra 5,000 more than what we were going to offer at the time. So it was 10. Was it? It was that 10, was, 50 was it? 50% increase. Yeah, they 50% asked, increase. They asked for 30 altogether and they were given uh, 20. Right. Uh, okay. There was uh, $6,110 left to spend. Okay, so Andy, put in your motion, put an amount that you you would take to add to that. Okay, so they, they've been getting 10, they've been getting 20 practically for the whole time they've been getting any money. They, this is the first time they really asked for an increase up to 30. And you're not back yet, Stuart. You're not back yet. Let's see, now wait a minute. I, see, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay, so Andy, just um, put a dollar into your amount now that you know 
what's the, the, the six thousand six thousand and ten dollars or whatever it was the full amount okay you want to put the full amount in okay yeah. do we have a seconder on that chris you had been the seconder okay yeah, chris, second. okay so andy i think you've made your point chris you want to say something then then dirk had his hand up yeah, I think that it's, it's an excellent spend given the results of the citizen budget and that is, I mean, that's just overwhelming. But I think in general, what people are looking for right now is an ability to get out and do stuff. And I think it's a good spend. Yeah, they also may be able to actually do some of their projects this year that some other things may not happen. Dirk. Yeah. Uh, I didn't have any comment, but it just struck me that it might cost do an extra six grand for COVID signs this year. <laughs> That's a good point. Okay, anybody want to say anything else? Janice? I would just say that we only got feedback from 114 people. Yeah, I would agree, but I, there's, you know, there's just a, yeah. there's, the trails are a huge thing. I mean, I, I personally, I'm prejudiced because I wanted to give them more money when we looked at it before. So, you know, you don't, you don't have to convince me that, that there's a lot of people in this town who support trails. It's like it's everywhere, right? Okay, I'm gonna call a question. All in favor of the surplus amount to the trails? In favor and opposed? Nobody opposed. Okay, now how do we get Stuart back? Someone open a beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see, maybe I, oh yeah, he's back. Okay, good. Okay. Stuart, okay. I said beer and you came back. It was perfect. Okay. Elise was listening to the meeting. She called me back. Oh, that's good. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so now we are moving on. We're just doing great, you guys. We're already at invoices paid for municipal services. So someone make a motion that we approve them or should we just hold on all our money? Who's going to make the motion? Janice makes the motion. A seconder. Chris seconds. Okay, any comments or questions about the money we spent? No? All in favor? Raise your hands. There we go. Stuart, you're voting. Voting. Good. Thank you. Okay. Now we've got city reports. So we've got our public works report, our water production, bylaw enforcement, building permit report, and updated task list. Anybody have any questions on any of these? Start at the top one if you do, and we'll move right through them. Anything? Okay. Nothing on public works. We see them working, doing lots of signage stuff to water production. No questions there. Bylaw enforcement. No questions there. We still don't have a bylaw officer, right, Cynthia? That's correct. Yeah. So. Yeah, let's not make that public. I know. We, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Please don't report that, citizens who are still listening to us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, building permit report, giant decrease in March, which as we know, we still have our building department, our planning department open. We, construction is still going on. I think pe people are probably very nervous about the future, but we're hoping that construction season will go forward. Anybody have any questions on that one? No. Updated task list? No. Let us go. Okay, we are at members reports. Janice, start us off. Of course, I printed off my uh, printed off my notes, and that part didn't print. Yeah, please. Shall I go to somebody else while you look for it? Okay, you're you're muted. Janice, you're muted. Janice. Apparently, the unmuting doesn't work when you're looking at a different. Uh, <laughs> Dirk, you're so smart. It doesn't work when you're looking at a different program. Let's try this again. Okay. okay, so I participated in a telephone conference with Katrine Conroy. We discussed the evolving COVID-19 situation, how it was affecting the different levels of government, how to ensure all essential services are dealt with. Also discussed Ross and Council's resolution regarding the reclassification of short-term rental properties to Class 6 commercial learned that discussions are ongoing at a provincial level with one of the uh, short-term rental booking companies involved as well. Participated in several Midtown Transition Committee meetings, working with the architect, uh, Bonnie Madison, to finalize design features on the proposed project for presentation to receive a development permit approved by council, and that worked out well. Um, attended a remote hospital board meeting. The 2020 budget requisitions were, were approved. Discussion ensued 
uh, regarding the importance of maintaining an appropriate reserve by borrowing for large long-term infrastructure projects, especially with unknown potential upcoming demands on our local healthcare system. Uh, participated in a Zoom meeting with the Recreation Task Force. They're finalizing their report regarding um, aquatic recreation options for presentation April 20th at our next meeting. I'm very impressed with the quality of work and capacity this group has demonstrated. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that I know that um, Kathy and Brian maybe had a call with Selena Robinson. And when I was looking through the information about the uh, property tax deferral program, I noted uh, that there was a program called the Financial Hardship Property Tax Deferral Program. Um, at some point, it was available for 2009 and 2010. So we might want to, um, as, a, as a group or Kathy maybe, we might want to press the, um, the province to maybe expand their program so we can include Stuart if we have to. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Okay, is that it? That's it. That's it, okay. Yeah, I have that at, on my list actually to talk to her it was out of that conversation. Um, Dirk, you're up, but you're muted. Uh, am, I, am I still muted? Nope, you're okay now. Okay, um, I, just three things. Uh, I, I did go just before everything hit the fan. I was in uh, Windsor for a funders meeting for the FCM funding for the 100% renewables. That was fascinating. I have six pages of notes, most of which I'm still trying to figure out how to read and assimilate. Uh, I've been a little bit busy and in isolation since getting back. So I'll get something to you folks, but it was really interesting to see what many other communities across the country are doing. Um, we had our sustainability commission meeting. You saw the minutes on the 18th. Uh, mostly that was just uh, Excitement over the volunteer event. Everybody's really pleased how well that went. Food Task Force is still trying to get the fruit press into the library and that finalized. 25 people came out to that energy talks um, for the solar and the passive house. It was quite fascinating. And then uh, looking at a social distancing plant swap of some sort coming up uh, since Earth Day is probably canceled if there's an earth still. Um, April 2nd, we had the 100% uh, renewables meeting online, which was really nice given the message that uh, the 100% renewables is sending. Uh, mostly the meeting was looking at how the 100% renewables effort goes forward given some pretty dramatic changes that we're all aware about. So um, I think we've got a meeting coming up with Matt about how to assimilate it and keep it as a priority for the local government and move forward. And that's about it for me. Okay, great. Andy, you're on mute or you're frozen. Andy. Um, I've had, yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. I, I've had uh, a number of meetings with regional district in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, I've got halfway through a report uh, that I'm going to present. Um, I guess a couple of the one highlight was obviously that uh, the regional district has passed their budget, which of course goes on to our uh, our our budget deliberations or our budget numbers, and and Elma and our ta final tax uh, rate will be uh, relative to uh, their ask as well. Um, uh, that budget was uh, reduced from the original with with an influx of uh, reserve funds that have went in for the overall reduction in the budget, uh, but there's still an increase this year. So um, uh, the other thing, I guess, with regional district and, and uh, certainly Brian uh, has been very uh, communicating a lot with regional district as far as the EOC uh, and the, um, the fact that they have announced a level two uh, activation on the emergency um, committee uh, relative to the freshette, the anticipated freshette coming up. Uh, and thankfully, the weather is, is cooperating on that front for us. Uh, a nice, slow, steady melt so far, fingers crossed. And of course, the, the COVID uh, issue, the uh, pandemic has, has boosted it from a level one to level two. So there has been activation. People are working behind the scenes on planning. Uh, and I know that Brian and our staff are aware of um, the, the regional response at this point. So I will endeavor to finish that report and get it in for next week's uh, information package. Okay, great, thanks. Stuart. 
I also attended the uh, Recreation Task Force um, Zoom meeting uh, towards the preparation of the plan for what we're going to do with the pool. Um, that's all I got. Okay, Chris. Um, all of my groups have been dormant and not doing anything. Um, but uh, Kathy, I want to ask about the economic roundtable tomorrow. Uh, what time is that at? Uh, one o'clock. One o'clock. Um, is there a link for it? Uh, yeah, I can send it to you. Would you mind? Thank you. I don't mind a bit. When you make it up. Um, and, uh, and, you know, now that the chamber's getting a little bit more active in our community, I'd like to work a little closer with them if I can on a council level. Um, we could talk more about that offline. Well, that would be great. We used to have a council representative, you know, with, you know, affiliated with the chamber, right? There was always back and forth there. Um, there was a lot there. When they were local, there was a liaison. Okay, good. Um, that's it, Chris, for you? Yeah, okay. Um, I've got a few things. So we are going to continue our weekly council uh, staff yep. information um, Zoom meetings. So we'll, we'll keep doing that. Um, we're still working out the bugs here. My screen did freeze, by the way, just saying. Um, and I don't know if Scott's still on the line, but I got to meet Scott Lamont today. I was really sorry that uh, we haven't all been able to meet him, but I think he's going to be a great addition to our staff. Um, he was on the line and he may still be, but I can't see because my screen's frozen. Um, also want you all to know that uh, City Hall and Public Works thanked us for the pizzas that we brought and delivered to them as a token of our appreciation for the hard work they're doing. So that was good. Um, we're going to continue to have these weekly meetings with Minister Robinson and it's, it's, she does a little update and then it's supposed to be Q&A and it's, it's regional. They've divided the, the province into the different um, sort of the different um, I think there's like six regions that they may correspond with the EOC. I'm not quite sure about that with the EO, emergency management um, uh, divisions of the, of the province. Anyway, we were all supposed to, everyone was going to be called on to ask their one question, um, but they couldn't get the technology to work on that. So we wrote our questions in and mine were questions about the impact on grant programs, both for infrastructure and possible issues with BC housing. Um, and then also about, um, uh, they, they just, uh, BC Hydro has deferred their payments for utilities. And I had asked if the province was having any conversation with Fortis along the same line. Now, BC Hydro is a crown corporation, Fortis is a private company, but you know, we, you, you never know, right? So we haven't gotten answers to that yet, although they did acknowledge the questions. Um, and then also, this talk about the um, property tax deferral, that's on my list to talk to them about, to, to put that on for this week coming up when we have our conversation, which is on Thursday, I think. Um, so interesting today, uh, this took a, a few meetings to get set up, but Minister Heyman had contacted me, his office had contacted me, wanted to talk about plastic bags, which I thought, boy, this isn't really the time, right? You know, <laughs> but it was, it was, and, you know, I guess, you know, just to understand where, where the province is at, they were about to release their single use plastics program for the whole province, like two days before everything blew up with COVID. So it's put on hold now. But um, his, his office basically said any municipality that's sending in their bylaws that they, that they have, have done, he's basically just approving them. And then when the province gets around, gets back, back up and running and they put together their provincial thing, um, that then we would just you know, rescind ours and go with the provincial. Um, theirs is going to be bigger than ours. Theirs is going to deal with um, a number of single use items, not just plastic bags. So I think it would, we, we don't have to, I don't think we have to do anything else to ours. Just send it to Minister Heyman's um, office and they do their review and they get back to us. So I'd like to say that, that we do that. I'd like to suggest that we direct staff to do that. Um, staff, do you need a motion for that or will you just take it on? Uh, you can make a motion on that, sure. Okay, so we have a motion. Janice makes it, Andy seconds it, any discussion, all in favor, we're good to go. Yeah, we just send it. Okay, um, the uh, resort municipality mayors are having meetups too on Zoom. We're gonna do it every two weeks. And it is interesting to hear the different concerns that different municipalities have. Some of them, like the out ones nearer to Alberta, they're concerned about COVID migrants, right, who are coming to their second homes and they're trying to keep them away because they don't have um, facilities. 
hospital facilities that would, would serve the larger population. Tofino has the same thing. They have a tiny hospital. They really don't want um, visitors, so they are actively pushing people away. Um, see, there was another one that had a different issue. Uh, Shoot, I can't remember what it was, sorry. Um, anyway, so we're all talking about those things. And then also talking about the recovery plan afterwards. Uh, Minister Baer from the, the tourist, tourist, Tourism Ministry <coughs> has some um, plans. So there's gonna be some more announcements, more aid programs specifically dark, targeted towards tourism. So that would be good when that comes out. Um, this week, there's gonna be a regional call with the RCMP. I think it's gonna be the first of several. Um, then, of course, Dirk had mentioned the 100% Renewable Group meeting over Zoom. Um, one of the concerns that came up in there was whether we can still meet the original timeline to get the plan adopted by all the various councils by December. Um, Castlegar didn't seem to think they'd had any trouble. I thought we might, um, because the next step is to get these sort of specialty groups to give input and meet and then more public input and all that just seems complicated to me to do over electronic means, but we'll see. Um, I shared the thought exchange results with everybody. There were 423 people who participated. We can just drool over that, that our financial citizen budget can get 114, but this one got 423, which was great. There were 432 thoughts shared and 11,600 rankings. So the question asked was really what were the main considerations that Roslinger should be thinking about as we navigate COVID-19. And it was really heartening to see that a lot of the concern was how we deal with our most vulnerable, what we can do to support people in our community and our businesses. Um, and then also people really got the fact that uh, you need to stay home and social distancing. But of course, the only people who responded to it were people who felt that way, right? The people who said, no, I want to party, they, you know, they didn't participate in the, in the thought exchange. So again, it's skewed, <laughs> but that's where that goes. Um, the last thing I have is that, you know, we're, we've, we're still in the middle of this, as we hear Dr. Bonnie say, you know, we're right in the middle. We got to, everybody's got to be, you know, full on talking about, um, you know, keeping their social distance and staying at home and all of that. And now there's just been a shift made about talking the, um, um, uh, federal health minister has, has actually recommended that people wear masks, uh, citizens wear masks in public more to protect others from, you know, anything. You might be, a, you might be asymptomatic, but you might actually have the virus. So if you wear a mask, um, that could be, that could help. And that's been, there's been a lot of, um, science of now that up throughout the world saying that that actually is really has been helpful. Obviously, this is people wearing homemade masks. This is not people taking the N95s or the surgical masks that are need for frontline workers. Um, but to this, to this effort, there's some local doctors um, here uh, who are looking to work with community members to get, you know, people to sew the masks and then get a distribution up so that people maybe to our seniors, maybe to, you know, a number of a number of places we'd, you know, give masks to. So I'm actually have a conversation with some people who are working on that effort. Susan Benzer, who's president of the KB, KBRH Medical Staff Association and Kootenai Boundary Physicians Association, had given the green light to support this initiative. Um, and she made a good comment. She said, you know, people really want to help in this time of crises. And so making masks would be medicine for the soul, which I thought was a nice way to, nice way to put it. Um, I was also on the call with Katrine and also at Midtown. And I think that's, oh, there's going to be a zero waste fundraising on April 25th instead of a in-person um, Earth Day kind of thing. And that's the zero waste thing that Craig DeLong is part of Sustainability Commission, although I think this initiative is not Sustainability Commission, but it's to do the plastics from plastic to transform it into some useful plastic item, give it new life. Um, so that's kind of an interesting project that's going on in town. And I'm going to go to that uh, virtually just to learn more about it. And I think that is it, unless somebody has anything else to say. We have no in camera, we have no declassified, and so I'll take a motion to adjourn. Or do you have a comment? And Andy? You're you're muted. You're muted. Yeah. You're muted. Here I am. Okay. Okay. So uh just recently 
uh, like in yesterday or today, a regional district has sent out a request to citizens to stay home uh, beyond um, literally stay home, not, not to attend or visit their second homes or cottages. Yeah. I know that uh, Christina Lake specifically is really concerned. We have a lot of Rosin citizens that have uh, second homes or cottages at, in Christina Lake. Uh, and I wonder whether um, we, can, we can make an appeal to our citizens directly uh, in Rosin that folks don't visit their second. It's pretty convenient, 45 minutes away, they could easily drop over and for many of them, they can drive right into their cottages or a short bo boat ride. So just, just as that appeal is coming out now, uh, and I'm sure there's also uh, folks from Roslyn that head to Kootenai Lake and have residences there too. So uh, I will, I will uh, endeavor to get that notice. It just came to me today. Yeah, no, I saw it. It came out, yeah. Okay, it, good. And, and uh, maybe we can add that to our notifications going out. Okay, okay, sounds great. Anybody have anything else or we'll take a motion to adjourn? We're done. What time is it? We did very well, guys. Our first electronic meeting, I think, worked well. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah. Good. Okay, do we want to? Uh, do we want to have a Zoom beer? I do, but I don't have any beer, and I'm in City Hall. <laughs> well, I beer in City Hall. I wasn't going to do it on this one. I was going to shut it down and invite you all. So you know. <laughs> Sounds I great. see Stuart got ahead of us. I'm in. He is. He is. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going okay. home. I'm going home. So send me the link and I'll, I'll join you. I will. Okay. Anybody, yep. uh, anybody from staff want to be invited? I see Darren's long gone. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks see so much you. for making this work. Talk yeah. to y'all in a bit. Okay.